Sending flowers has always been the best way to show someone you care, but it isn't always easy or satisfying. Thankfully, Books.com is a better way to buy flowers with fully transparent pricing and an easy shopping experience and an incredible selection starting at $40. Plus, they take customer service very seriously, so if they make a mistake, they will make it right. Show every mom in your life you care with flowers from the Books Company. Just visit B-O-U-Q-S.com and enter promo code WATCH for 20% off your Mother's Day purchase. Flowers will sell out. Out, so don't wait. Hey, what's up? This is Chris from The Watch. Obviously, you're listening to The Watch. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is a really special episode for me and Andy. We got a chance to sit down with one of our favorite musicians, Greg Dooley, uh, who you would probably know best from the Afghan Wigs, a long-running American rock band. Afghan Wigs made their splash, I guess, in the mid-90s with some seminal albums like Gentleman and Black Love. They were originally signed on Sub Pop and, you know, loosely drawn into the sort of alt-rock explosion that was happening in the 90s where they made the transition from, you know, nominally indie rock into a major label uh, rock and roll around, you know, 95, 96, 97. And they put out these incredible albums that were equal parts influenced by like Curtis Mayfield, Pusker Du, um, you know, the Jackson Five. And it was uh, a really amazing time for them. Like, they were just making these concept albums about shattered lives. And Andy and I were enamored with them back then and continue to be through Dooley's work. Um, with the end of the original version of the Afghan Wigs, he made an album, they made an album called 1965, which you should definitely check out if you haven't heard it. And then uh, Greg wound up doing a different project called The Twilight Singers for a lot of the beginning of the 21st century, and they made several albums, many of which are excellent. Uh, Powder Burns, Blackberry Bell. um, And then a couple years ago, something surprising happened. The Afghan Wigs got back together. Uh, John Curley and Greg Dooley reunited. Uh, John Curley's the bass player, and they uh, made an album, a great great reunion record called Due to to the Beast. And um, they're back again now with a new album called In Spades, which is out tomorrow on Sub Pop. It's a continuation of a lot of the things people love about African Wigs, but it's a really different record. Uh, It sounds different. To me, it sounds like as equally influenced by Blonde by Frank Ocean as as it is by ZNRK by Husker Du or There's No Place Like America Day by Curtis Mayfield. It is a very open-eared record. It, 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 It sounds like today. Uh, it's a guy, it features some of Greg's uh, most impressive vocal work. He's a sort of a Los Angeles legend. Um, he came in to talk to us for the entire episode. We talked about um, the trajectory of his career from the 90s to before Afghan Wigs when he was just a, a guy growing up in Cincinnati and moving out to Los Angeles through to today and what it's like to be in such a long-running band and kind of have music be this profession instead of just your passion. So here's our... Uh, interview with Greg Dooley. You can catch us on Monday and we'll be catching up with a lot of the TV that we've missed over the past week or so. I would expect us to talk about Leftovers, obviously, but also uh, Hemet Tale and maybe even American Gods. Um, if uh, if I can talk Andy into it, I'm sure he, he'll, he'll be down to watch that. Um, one note you might want to check out earlier this week, we had a great episode with Tim Simons from Veep uh, and he came by and talked about working on Veep, obviously, in in the time of Trump. He also talked about his appreciation for leftovers, and we talked a little bit of of golf, a little bit about golf and Matthew McConaughey together, if that that makes sense. So check that episode out. Uh, Thanks for listening. As always, here's our interview with Greg Dooley. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. All right, well, we'll just get started. All right, we are, this is a special one for me and Andy. I'm very excited. Um, we are joined by, I think, collectively one of our favorite musicians. I know he's one of my favorite songwriters of all time. Why, why are you throwing me under the tour bus? Well, I know, I, you know, you, you also have like a lot of, you know, uh-huh. like the go-betweens are pretty high up there for you, uh-huh. you know. <laughs> yes, but they're not here today. Uh, Greg Dooley from the Afghan Wigs is joining us today on The Watch. Greg, man, thank you so much for coming through. My, my pleasure. Thanks for wearing the Ronnie Van Zant t-shirt. <laughs> if you're me. He definitely, definitely dresses this is for the day. This tonight's the night, man. I, that's the shirt that Ronnie Van Zant wore on, on the cover of uh, Street Survivors. <laughs> he so, knows. Yeah. This is for you. Right. We used to make these at. Um, I used to work at a record store in New York City, and we would we made like slightly a little bit of money by like basically just screening record covers and just printing them onto t-shirts. Mm-hmm. So. It, it, one of the many supplemental that, that sounds incomes. more profitable than selling records at, at Mondo okay. Kim's. Yeah, Even, yeah. Uh, my uh, when I was uh, twenty, I worked in a photo lab 
in Cincinnati and we had uh, uh, our supplemental income was driver's licenses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did pretty well. I can I imagine. To say, you know, they were really good. This was before watermarks and yeah. holographics and things like that. What was that. the duly touch? Like how, what what did you bring to it? Yeah, did you did you put a lot of people I, from Hawaii uh, I, or anything? You know what? I I was uh, um I was the typer. <laughs> I did, you know, I did I did a lot of the uh, I did a lot of the typing, but it was it was we did great jobs and just kind yeah. of like, you know, just sort of alter the all you have to do is really alter one number if you're doing it right. For the record, the watch does not condone this, no. but okay. yeah. but we fully support it. Sure. Um it's great. called make it's called making a living. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's also like if, if they ever remake the great escape, you can be the forger. Oh yeah, I can I I've, I I can forge. Greg, you and might, forage. And forage. You might, I was going to say, you might not remember this. Chris didn't remember this either. Um, before we get into it, we want to talk about the new Afghan Wigs record. We want to talk about a lot of the a lot of your career because okay. we're such big fans. Cool. But we realized, well, I remembered, Kristen, that this is not the first time the two of us have jointly interviewed you. 17 years ago, wow. as young cub reporters for Grit magazine, or Grit. not really, but it was for Spin, but oh, okay. it felt like Grit because we were very young men. Um we interviewed you on the Twilight Singers tour bus. I think it was the first Twilight Singers tour at the Bowery Ballroom. And here was our first mistake. We had a great time. Okay. But our first mistake was we didn't ask the interviewing schedule because you know what it's like. like right, yeah. you, they, the journalists come on the bus, they come off the bus, they talk to you about the record. Right. We, you know, usually you follow, oh, that's the guy from Time Out in New York or that's someone from Rolling Stone. We followed a guy from High Times. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> he, I realize now it was a pretty popular interviewer yeah. because yeah. he comes bearing gifts. Yes. High Times is the opposite of Playboy where it's like you read Playboy for the articles. <laughs> yes. I think you do interviews with the High Times to do interviews with the High mm. Times. That was great. And, and I think maybe that tour was sponsored by ZigZag. <laughs> <laughs> it actually I'm was. Sure, that it was. <laughs> no, I'm saying, I think that, it was because we, we, we did a we did a zigzag tour, and uh, um, and high times <laughs> was around a lot. You know, not to mention just kind of like a, a general feeling around <laughs> around the situation. <laughs> the, the times were high. Yeah. It, that was interesting too because um, we were both Chris and I were big Wigs fans. We were also big fans of the Twilight Singers, and, and now things have come full circle again. But. Not to dwell too much in the past, but I was curious at that time, what was that era like for you? Because you had been in a certain band for a while. You had been in a certain century for a while. All of a sudden, everything was a little bit different. Um, what was the beginning of the 21st century like for you as a music maker? I, I mean, if you, if you saw me in 2001, that was one version. But I, if, if that was the first Twilight yeah. Singers album? Yeah. Hated that tour, and that that one actually I didn't tour again for two years right. after that because I, I was I was so um, I was just not a, a, a happy person. But um, Scott Ford, who ended up becoming the bass player of the of the the Twilight Singers, um, <clears throat> I was just cranking songs and just kind of making them. But by that time, uh, me and my friends had bought the shortstop, and I was working the, at the, the shortstop bar in Echo Park. Yeah. And, you know, all of a sudden I had like 20 songs and Scott was like, man, you need to, we need to put out an album. And I was like, nah, <laughs> putting out an album means I have to go on tour and I have no desire to do that ever again. And he's like, come on. And he, it, it, Scott Ford is actually probably like more responsible for me, like making albums again, touring again, really? sitting here right now than, than probably any person. Do you think you just would have like... Been a bartender? Not I think I was like I, I really kind of liked the the yeah yeah yeah. I mean, at the for for that time in my life, and who knows? But but at that moment, I had I was really happy, like having a job to go to and not having to go on tour, yeah. and not having to like. I made songs because I wanted to. It was actually like more of a therapeutic thing. Yeah. So it's interesting uh, you say that because we were just talking that for us the last fifteen years of your career has seemed so wildly prolific. Yeah. And yeah. and adventurous and mm -hmm. exciting. And it's interesting that if we if we date it to around that time, you were resistant to it. I was I was I was actually just not I had no interest in in touring. 
I liked, I still liked making songs, but after that tour, I probably didn't like write a song or anything for a year. Was it, what was it about that tour in particular? I don't know. I think it was like the, uh, you the, know. Those two guys that interviewed you after high times? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Terrible was, questions. It, it, was a, it was a weird throw together band of people that it just, we went out for the wrong reasons yeah. and, and it was not a, a Th- that that group of individu- individuals did not gel, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I was just kind of over it. I think I had just been kind of in the grind for too long. I mean, I've been you know touring for fifteen years by that point anyway. So, you know, you're catching me on the next fifteen, which is has been much more enjoyable. Okay, okay. good. I'm kind of curious about that because you. Afghan Wigs reunite. There's a bunch of 20 year anniversaries of, of records, that are, and mm-hmm. then you guys do do the Beast. I'm not sure if the chronology is exactly right there. I mean, I know you just did the tour for Black Love, but now you're on the second Afghan Wigs point two point sort of album. And do you ever feel like it's like it becomes industrialized again when you kind of like settle into like okay, album tour, album tour? How do you keep it fresh for yourself now that you're doing the second lap around with with this band? Um. I did a solo tour last year, mm-hmm. and that has been a great way for me to reboot. Yeah. And uh, um, I realized a couple of years ago, I was like, wow, I've, I've kind of parked the Twilight Singers for a little while and been doing this, the Wigs thing. I'm like, I didn't want to drift too far away from that Twilight Singers material. I love those songs. It's the, They're the most current songs to me other than these last two Wigs records. So going out and doing that, and if, you know, I, I, I would look at the set list and I'm like, man, I'm only doing like one wig song yeah. in this show. You know, I'm sort of like, but then I I, uh, I, uh, um, I previewed a couple songs that are on this new album during that tour. So that, that, that was a cool thing, too. Uh, but that keeps it that keeps it fresh for me. Uh, doing the Gutter Twins a few years ago with mm-hmm. Mark. Yeah was a great thing and and then a year later we did an acoustic tour just me him and dave rosser so uh uh there, there's various ways for me to to keep it interesting and and i think also like i i, I i've been resistant of like doing those 125 date tours yeah where it just sort of becomes like blinding for me like you know it was it was cool when i was a kid and i like i like about 75 that's sort of like my sweet spot now yeah. you know what i mean that that's, still sounds like it, a lot it's plenty of shows <laughs> yeah. but it's not like those that next 50 will kill you yeah you know what i mean so coming back bringing the afghan wigs back though i mean you you left us on at, 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 in the first iteration of the band in 1965 mm-hmm. in which came out in 98 and that's a record that, that we both love i think feel like Chris almost got his friend fired, his friend at Columbia fired for like stealing the advanced cassette. So we right. could, right. it almost, we also, the other story that we, also, that we often tell in this podcast is it almost cost Chris his relationship with a I girlfriend. I, I, on he, a girlfriend's birthday, I was like, happy birthday. And then like me and a bunch of friends went into another room a and bunch listened of dudes. to 1965. That was, to listen to the advanced cassette. That was so dark. Thank Why you didn't for you that. invite her? Because <laughs> we were 20. All right. like, oh, rock wow. music matters. Right, it's right. for us. Oh, wow. That's great. That was, and she had made acorn squash and everything oh. was very like faux grown up. Oh. Are you still friends? Uh, no, no. We're, we're friends. Not because not right, like, I'm you. not friends. <laughs> we talked a lot. Yeah. Uh, but um, that, you, that, you put the weeks to bed with that record. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's been so exciting about Due to the Beast and now in spades is that it's clearly, it's you, it's, uh, it's, it's Curly, it's, it's the Afghan Wigs. Right. But it's a very different band yeah. with a very different ambitions sonically um, in terms of your songwriting. What... How would you define that? Like, what what made these Wigs records again? Um, because, Frank, you know, in spades, you're doing things with your voice. You're doing things um, mm. musically that you've never done before. I, I I just feel like I've this. It's my fifteenth record with all of the bands that yeah. I've been in, and uh, um, I feel like I feel at the height of my powers now. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like. I kind of know what I'm doing, mm-hmm. and I'm and I'm just dangerous enough to get away with it. So, <laughs> uh, um, it, it it feels good to try things. Like I, I did twenty twenty two songs for for this record, and 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 pared it down until I got you know. I always like to I I consider these songs when I put them on a record like a family, and it's if if the family can interact mm-hmm. in a in a. Uh, 
in a groovy way. So uh, um, this this time, I just started like Birdland, for instance, mm-hmm. the first song. Never never done a song like that before. Had no plans to do a song like that. And furthermore, freestyled the vocal. Never wrote the words. Are down. you serious? Yeah. In the studio. Yeah. Into the mic. First yeah. time. Yeah. Not the first time, but, but this, when you were. But the second time, <laughs> I did. Whoa. Yeah. And I've done that five times in my life, uh, in thirty years, and it's always like you're not even writing the song. It's a, you're just you're you're the channel. Those are the other times those have made it. Those have made it onto the record. Or they... Yeah. The other times were mm, tonight mm-hmm. on Congregation. Um, now you know yeah. on Gentlemen. I remember reading an interview once that you that you don't actually remember recording forty dollars on Powder Burns. Is that accurate? I, Is that I, one I, that you characterize I, that? I, as I, one? I, I'm pretty sure I wrote the. I'm pretty sure I wrote some of those words down, but that one was pretty freestyled too. I mean, I I listen. I I actually listened to it last year before I because I I, mm-hmm. I did it in the show last year. And that song in particular, like, really blows my mind. It's really kind of like, like I thought I was Mark Bolin or something like that. You know what I mean? But there's a moment in that song where you and everything in the song goes to 11, where the yeah. song suddenly, like, it, it leaves the bounds of Earth's gravity right. and it causes the listeners to feel that they've done the same thing. Yeah. And that it, it's exciting to hear that that had the same effect on you because it does transcend. It did, Well, you know, I mean, that's... That song was brought to you by cocaine. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it in the yeah. best possible Sponsor way. Sponsor of, yeah. of some of your most beloved music. <laughs> um, what I'm curious about within Spades in particular, and Andy kind of touched on this a little bit, is like we saw you get, you play the Benefit Show a couple mm-hmm. of months ago uh, downtown. At the and, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know we saw you play Toy Automatic and Oriole, and I was like, fuck yes, this mm-hmm. sounds like Greg's been listening to like late Husker Du. I'm like really into this. Wow. And then the record comes out and like those, even those songs are like, there's like tons of strings. Mm -hmm. You're doing all this different stuff with your voice. I love, I always love it when there's like, just like the live version of a song and the studio version of a song have completely different personalities. But, uh, you know, was the actual writing or production of this album any different than say Do The Beast or, or even late period Twilight Singer stuff? The uh, the thing about late period Twilight Singers and Due to the Beast is is not a lot of those songs were done live. Um, uh, a lot of Due to the Beast, I played a lot of the instruments. Like I played drums on almost half. Really? Uh, I play bass on a few. Um, there. This record was done live with the band. Like other than the spell and Birdland, the other eight songs were mm-hmm. cut live with the touring band, uh, and um, and then obviously overdub and sung. But I hadn't done that since Black Love. That wow. was, it had been twenty years since I played with a band. And, and <clears throat> while I wrote the songs, those the parts that the that are played by the other guys are their parts. They're, they they. I can't. I can take no credit for that. I, I gave very little direction huh. in terms of. I, I really kind of let them do their own thing. And and is that how is that how Black Love was was done in the studio? Yeah, I was a little more. Uh, I, I was a little more hands on with Black Love. Like I was, you know, looking back, I was probably, you know, feeling the pressure <laughs> of the predecessor. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? But. Uh, uh, I feel no pressure these days. You know, I'm just sort of like, I I mean, I sort of like walk into the situation thinking like, dude, you're good. Good, Just go be good. Yeah, right. You know, there's, you you mentioned being at the peak of your powers, which I would agree with, but part of that is knowing what you're, what you're good at and what you want to push past and, you know, what you want to return to. And I'm wondering how much, and it's interesting because you did. We saw you guys play Black Love, and it sounded great, which meant you had to revisit that record at least, yep. you know, to relearn it and refamiliarize yourself with it. Listening to the new record, hearing your voice do things I didn't know it could do, hearing the band do things I didn't know it could do, and then like you get to light as a feather. And there's a little bit of that Black Love swag. There's the black, creeps it's a little in. Black Love, little sixty-five ish in there. Yeah, too. yeah. there's a little, and and, um, and, and a little, it's like a, and a little, little treat, and a little bit of Scorpions, too, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm not mad at. Yeah. So you, you got to adjust the dial, right? You can give yeah. that to us when 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 we deserve it. Well, 
I mean, I'm me. So, and I did all those <laughs> other songs. So, like, I, I talked to some guy from Italy today, and he and he made some mention of like, I'm light as a feather. It sort of reminds, me. and I'm like, dude, it's me. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, it's not like a. I wasn't like he probably did it in a cooler Italian accent. Than right, I did. He, he definitely. <laughs> it was a, cool a sexier accent. question. But I was, I was, I was, I was like, dude, I was not body snatched. If, if, <laughs> if, if I, if I happen to light onto something that reminds you that of something I did, then eh, it's still, it's still in there. Light, I'll tell you, like light as a feather in particular. I had nothing going to the studio that day. Like, uh, and where did you record the record? We recorded it in, in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and. We did it a month after the last show for the Due to the Beast tour. Mm -hmm. Like we played at Barcelona and and we went out to dinner and like let's we're playing really well. Let's go in mm -hmm. quickly. So we went in like three weeks later, I think, and uh, we were in there for eight days. And five of the songs on In Spades were done in those eight days. Wow. Like, and one of them was Light as a Feather. And the day that we went in, I had nothing, but I was driving my my car to the studio and Jive Talking by Bee Gees came on the radio <laughs> and I was like, wow, I really like that. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then I came in and John Skibbick and I, who uh, we share a love of heavy metal and hard rock, and uh, we began talking about our favorite Scorpion songs, <laughs> As one and, does uh, in the studio. Uh, um, and unconsciously, that was the that's how that song was built. I mean, uh, uh, one of my favorite songs by Scorpions is "No One Like You." Okay, and if if there's if you listen, "Light as a Feather" to me is a combination of. Jive talking and no That's one good. like you by the Scorpions. So. I, I hope you don't mind going back a little bit in the vaults for, no, for some questions I'll, because I'll, I'll go all the way back. Because something in particular that I've been curious about for a while, um, the '90s, as Chris and I lived through it as music fans, um, was we, we talk about this on the show actually a bunch. That one of the biggest divides that I found when I got to college. I got to college in '95, and I had friends who like came to my room and they saw. Maybe had an Afghan Wigs record. They saw that I had a Guided by Voices record or Pavement record, and then they got to the Biggie and Wu Tang records and were like, "You're kidding!" Right. The divide between like the indie rock fandom and fans and fans of black music mm -hmm. was huge. Right. Um, you were in a band in that decade that was sometimes lumped in with grunge bands. You would, sure. you'd started on sub pop, but the Afghan Wigs never uh, shied away from love of African American music. Never shied away from love of writing about. Sex and funk, and saying you like the Bee Gees and the Scorpions. Sure. Um, what was that actually like in the moment? Because you you were lumped in with this stuff, but you were you were speaking a different language. We came. I mean, first of all, and I've I've whenever the grunge yeah. thing comes up, keep in mind that grunge was an invent uh, an invention yeah. by an English journalist, probably Everett True. Everett True, yeah, or or one of his. He was swinging on the flippity flop. Yeah, exactly. Well. <laughs> Many people were. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, that word to me, it's like I just always shrugged my shoulders. And if if someone wanted to call, it's it's just it's lazy journalism, mm -hmm. you know. In 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 my opinion, I have and have always played rock and roll, and rock and roll is a, a deep and wide river. So. Uh, you know, to to you know to subcategorize it, that's the job of people that write about music, not not it, me as a, a writer of music. But you so. had to. I mean, you were aware of this too at the time. Like saying I love rock and roll or I'm into mm -hmm. rock and roll, the '90s felt like combative. There was this turn towards um, whether it was in, forget the word grunge, but whether mm -hmm. it's sort of the indie rock uh, puritanism that sure. I think existed in a lot of the '90s. Um, yeah, but you guys were hardly ever a part of that. Well, I mean, no, but I'm I, just saying, like, to exist in that moment and I, to let and to have to cast the the net as wide as you did and as proudly as you did, sure, um, flew in the face of what a lot of other bands were doing at that I, time. You know, I mean, I I was also a very like vocal and out sports fan, yeah, which right. was not yeah. which was not uh, cool with a, a lot of people. You yeah. know, like, you know, to get called a jock, I'm like, well, you know. I, I did play sports in school. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, like playing sports, like taught me how to interact with people and get the best out of them, get the best out of myself, you know, like 
exhi- you know, exhibit leadership qualities, mm-hmm. all of this, the stuff that, you know, that you can and should get out of group activity. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of, of that kind of music, like, man, I grew up listening to black music. That's, mm-hmm. you know, my mom was a teenager when I was born. Like, I inherited her record collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, I lived what, in What's the first record you remember her playing? <clears throat> it, I, I'm going to guess Martha and the Vandellas or uh, Marvin Gaye, Temptation, mm-hmm. Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, you know, like... the. the any of that stuff. And then, like, I, it, you know, I by getting her records, I, I became sort of omnivorous after that because uh, we lived in a, a um, kind of a l- lower middle class tract housing neighborhood and a lot of other young parents and kids my age. So, uh, um, you know, older kids would be like, hey, do you know... Rolling Stones mm-hmm. or Led Zeppelin. I'm like, no, what's that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I got my education that way. And then, you know, inevitably there was like the, hey, do you want to listen to, you know, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer? And I did not. Want was, to. There, was there a Husker <laughs> Du kid? Was there the punk kid? Well, the punk, like, I got into punk rock in college. Okay. Uh, um, uh, that's I, I saw Who's Du on I, I heard Who's Du when I worked at, at Tower. I probably heard uh um what would it have been? Eighty four would have been Zen Arcade. It would it would have been Zen Arcade. And then I, when I moved back to town, I saw them on the New Day Rising tour. That was the first time I saw uh um Who's Du and that that changed my life. Like it was, it was, I'd never seen three people make that much noise. Yeah. And I, in particular, like, I love the whole band, but like watching Grant Hart play drums and sing like that blew my mind. I started out as a drummer and I, I was also a singer, but I couldn't chew gum and, you know. <laughs> the drummer singer is like one of the but that, ultimate that, power that, that dude in particular, yeah. like that, that dude was a, a fucking machine and such a just on it like really soulful deep singer he was and he's the pop guy too it was so wild to like watch like he'd be drumming but he would be singing green eyes or whatever you know like green like green eyes and and uh keep hanging on in particular those two songs are like my favorite songs on, on on that record and uh 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 and divide and conquer which is also a great song but uh um I was blown away by uh, um, by, by that band, and I and I met Grant a couple years later, um, probably when we were touring up in it. Like, yeah. So my, not even a couple years later, like six, five or six years later, he came. We we played uh, University of Minnesota, like the student union, <laughs> with Mud Honey and Bullet La Volta. Wow. And. Uh, um, and he came to the show, and I was just, I was kind of, you know, really in awe of, of, of Grant Hart because uh, I saw that they, they, they did some of my favorite shows that I ever saw. And they also did one of the shows that at the, it was the end, and it was perfectly clear that they did not, they were not friends anymore. And it made me really sad. Yeah. Like I, I, I had I had a deep, deep, uh, you know, attachment to Husker Du. They're, you know, a life changing moment for me. One of the greatest bands in the history of rock and roll. So. There are a lot of stories um, when you speak to people in bands about how, um, especially as singers, when they say, you know, I, when I finally got up in front of the microphone, like all the people who've known me my whole life couldn't believe that I had done that. Like all of a sudden, that's who I was. I have the, I for I could be wrong. I feel like people didn't say that about you. Um, because you said you were a drummer. I'm curious when you made the move and then how quickly the swagger was there. I made the move. I was singing in bands by the time I was 14. Uh, so, and no one was surprised. <laughs> 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 
Hey guys, just want to tell you about our good buddies at Sonos. You know, uh, we obviously love watching television and movies here at The Watch, but nothing makes those television shows and movies come to life like the Sonos Playbase. The Playbase uh, is basically a way to have home theater sound in this really cool low profile speaker that goes right underneath your television stand. You barely notice it. It's sleek. It actually makes my television look better. No no disrespect to my TV. Um, Playbase's low profile design practically disappears beneath your TV, yet it fills the entire room with epic home theater audio. From movies and sports to TV shows and gaming, the slim, low-profile play bass adds dynamic, pulse-pounding sound to whatever's playing on your TV. It even streams your favorite music when it's off. Plus, since it was created for TVs that sit on stands and furniture, there's no wall mount required. You, all you need is one power cord, one optical cord, that's it. You don't even need to read the manual. The Sonos app guides you through every step of setup. Plus, everything sounds better on Sonos. Guys, I know you're listening. Nailing down your style can be a tricky feat, especially if you are not super into shopping. Thankfully, there's Bombfell, an online personal styling service that helps dudes find the right clothes for them. All you have to do is complete a simple questionnaire online, and then you're matched with a dedicated personal stylist who handpicks pieces from brands and designers around the world specifically for you. Once you've viewed your selections, you have 48 hours to make any changes, or you can just cancel altogether. You are in total control the whole time. No hidden fees, no gotchas, and your dressing room is any room in your house. That's a nice thing, too. You only pay for what you keep. There is no charge to send returns back. You can reschedule or you can skip shipments anytime. It is the most simple, straightforward service around. Bombfell is on your side because they don't make money if you don't find something you want to keep. And guys, let me tell you about this. I have a little personal experience with Bombfell. They got me to sign up, and I went through the process, and I explained myself to them. I explained what I, what I like to wear, what I don't like to wear. I had to tell them, this is very personal for me. I had to confess that I am allergic to wool, which is why moving to California was a good idea, because I've been cold for every winter of my life. Anyway, they picked out some stuff I wasn't totally sure about in the pictures, but I was willing to give it a chance, because again, this is all being done for me. I got the package, and just this morning, I tried on the shirt they sent me, the sweater they sent me, and the pants they sent me. And do you know who liked these clothes? I like them. You know who really liked the clothes? My wife. She basically said that the pants Bombfell sent me are the pants that I should have been wearing this whole time. That was tough to hear, but kind of a credit to Bombfell. And yes, I am wearing the pants right now. And producer Zach Mack has not complimented me yet, but I know that's forthcoming when I leave the studio. So, guys, do what I did. Try out Bombfell. It's really worth it. And best of all, we've partnered with them to get our listeners a special offer of 25 bucks off your first purchase when you go to bombfell.com slash watch. That's bombfell, spelled B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash watch. $25 off your first purchase. I honestly don't know what you're waiting for. You know, we, we were just talking, just hearing you like kind of talk about your your mom's record collection and seeing who's going made me think that one of my favorite things over the last couple of years to listen to has been your Spotify playlists. Oh, thank you. Because they're so eclectic, but they also betray such, like, just a, a curiosity and a passion for new music. Like, yeah. stuff where it's like, you're not, like, some people would just be like, I'm I'm done. I like, sometimes right. we're like we're done. You know what I mean? Right. And like you just might be like, I like these ten Migo songs, but I can't listen to four hundred of them or right. whatever. And and y- you know your stuff is just like it's such like a wide variety of stuff. And I was sort of a two part question: How do you find yourself ever exhausted by it? And I also wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the way that your listening habits functionally have actually changed because of like listening to streaming music players and stuff like that because I would imagine you have a massive record collection but now I did once once upon a time I had 3000 records yeah. you know and uh I I have 40 now really yeah and you know a quarter of those are Richard Pryor records <laughs> so um but uh um I'll tell you that my my life, my musical life kind of changed when I discovered Tune In Radio, which is like Tune In and Shazam are probably like the two most used applications that I that I that I use other than like, you know, sports websites yeah. or something like that. But uh, um, Tune In Radio, for those who don't know, it's like 
you you can basically like tune into any radio station mm-hmm. in the world, including Antarctica, which I, I did over and over until I realized it was the same playlist. Because <laughs> <over and over. laughs> no one's been there to change I, it. <laughs> I, I can tell you, like, if I if I put it on right now, I'd be able to hum to you the first song that you were about to hear before you heard it. And wow. then you, you, it's, it's really funny. But there's a couple like great songs that like Shazam doesn't work on the Antarctica playlist. Uh-huh. It rarely. And, you know, like. There's it's some deep stuff, a lot of John Prine. To, you know, <laughs> Whatever gets you is, through, man. Yeah, sure. Um, but um, my my kind of go to stations these days are there's this French radio station called FIP F I P. Probably the most shazammed station of my life. Hmm. Uh, Dub Lab here in L A. Uh, um, w E V L in Memphis. Which goes off the air at midnight. That's Memphis great. Time. Mm-hmm. Do they end with like the uh, national anthem, or do they, they don't? <laughs> but you know, I I, I kind of wish they would play like "America the Beautiful" by Ray Charles. That, yeah, that's the way TV used to do. And then uh, um, uh, there's a station in Montreal called CKUT that I I, I, I listen to a lot too. So those are kind of my those are the ones I meander through I, and uh, Bond, Bondi Beach Radio in Australia <laughs> wow. and uh, Berlin Community Radio oh, are no. also two great ones it's kind of exciting to hear you say this because one of the things that has always been the most joyful part of your music and certainly live is the way every song that you produce whether it's solo Twilight Singers Afghan Wigs especially performed live feels part of the larger dialogue and conversation with music as a whole oh, you have yeah. such fluency with other artists that you love and you have such uh, ability to weave them in and out I mean it's always I mean we, we are every interview you do including that Italian bastard I'm sure brought this up but you know you interpolate songs well known songs pop songs into the songs that you're playing live often in surprising and, and often beautiful ways my favorite recent one was over my dead body going into when we departed. Uh, right, oh, yeah. it's really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> but but th- but that makes everything feel alive in the way that music is supposed to. The way you feel that charge you used to get from hearing something on the radio and you didn't know what it was and you had to reach and find a cassette and jam it in and tape it and couldn't shazam it. You know, sure. It, it 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 it's inspiring to hear you draw a line basically between the way music used to make you feel and still makes you feel. I I um I like that uh uh um. That it still seems sort of like, oh, what what the fuck is he doing? You yeah. know, kind of that that's I I like that I can still have that effect on even like longtime listeners of of uh uh my group. When we got back together in two thousand twelve, I knew that we were gonna play the five main albums and mm-hmm. that's what we were there for and but in order for me to have like a root in the now, mm-hmm. I, 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 I I wasn't gonna try to write new songs. But every night we played uh, "See and Don't See" by Queenie Lyons and uh, uh, "Love Crimes" by Frank Ocean. Um, and then I began to interpolate like I, I forget which Channel Orange song into mm-hmm. "Love Crimes" also. Um, there were a bunch of people who obviously didn't know Queenie Lyons. I get it, although she was like a mainstay of my DJ career. Um, but that that first Frank Ocean, like the the Nostalgia Ultra mm-hmm. record, like I, I loved the whole thing. And uh, uh, when I when it got to the murder, murder, murder part of that song, I was like, oh, I, can, I can do this one. Yeah, and that's what happens. Like it's it's really like I don't like. It just kind of washes over me, and I'm like, "Oh, I could do that," you know. And it's very natural. It it has to be natural. If 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 I'm like challenged in any way, or mm-hmm. I have to try too hard, eh, you know. But there has to be an element too of like uh, like see you fuckers I told you like these songs are still alive like yeah. these aren't you're not a museum act. yeah like you sure. there were things that maybe I mean I remember I remember getting Black Love when it came out and being totally floored but totally challenged by it right it took me some songs it took me days some t- songs it took me years yeah some songs i feel like i heard for the first time when we saw you bring them back a couple months ago right um it's a, it's 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 not a race you know what i mean and i feel I, like often music can feel that way i i can tell you this like from my own uh material uh after the gentleman tour of 93 94 um 
I didn't play the song Gentleman again until 2012. Wow. Seriously? Didn't play Gentleman on the Black Love Tour. Didn't play Gentleman on the 65 Tour. I was just over it. Yeah. Like, it, it, you know, and I remember when we got back together, like, John was like, are you going to do Gentleman? And I'm like, I'll try it. You know, he's like, people are going to want to hear it. I'm like, I get that, <laughs> you know. Not a carnival act, but <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a go. You'll and dance see, if you need I'll, to. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go and, and see if, if it feels okay on me. And I loved it. You know, like huh. one, once I like got, once I had that 20-year break from mm-hmm. Gentleman, I was like, oh, hey, man, how's it going? Yeah. You guys have like the best, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be in the band, but it does seem like you guys have this incredibly touched career tra- trajectory in the sense that you got fans of pe- you got people who are fans of Congregation and Gentlemen. You got people who are fans of Black Love in 1965. You have people who might just be Twilight Singers fans. You got people who are like, you know what I mean? Like you, you refresh the 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 source material enough that you must not necessarily feel that handcuffed to any two or three Afghan Wig songs on a nightly basis. I mean, there you guys don't have Surrender. You can play Faded every night, but like yeah. that must be fun to play Faded. It, you it's know? it's fun to play Faded, but like I I can tell you that we have so many like kind of epic closers <laughs> that this this time I was like, eh, and I, I'm not trying to like bum anybody out because certainly I I love Faded too, but Faded is not a default closer. Yeah, like you know I I was. When we were making up the list uh, over the phone, me and Curly and John was like, let's play Omerta on, on oh, this yes. tour. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do. So there's that. I mean, Into the Floor has a very, you know, epic ending quality, too. So it's like where to find the, the, we have a, we, ha, we have a wealth of, yeah. of, of, of powerful closers. And like you said, not being tied to any kind of like hit uh and by the way like even uh, whenever i've gone to see the rolling stones and i'm like i almost want to go back and go you're the rolling fucking stones you do not have to play Mm -hmm. that song yeah let me make you a set list rolling stones (laughs) that will blow everybody away and probably blow yourselves away Mm -hmm. you know you have so many great songs that's that's what I like. And, I, and I'll tell you something else from like uh, uh, halfway through the Black Love Tour, I stopped playing Honky's Ladder. Never played it again. Didn't play it on the reunion tour. Mm-hmm. But when we played it at the Black Love show, I was like, oh, Honky's Ladder. You know <laughs> what good. I mean? That's yeah, good. I was kind of like, so, you know, little break. Yeah. Distance can be helpful yeah, in it's relationships. Great. Yeah, absolutely. There's. It seems like for some lucky artists, there's like a, a like a Nick Cave zone where you can enter into a later period of your like artistic life where the you understand the mechanics of what it takes to make a record and put out a tour and, and keep people engaged in your art. But it 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 happens almost not seamlessly. Obviously, there's probably a lot behind the scenes that we don't know about. But it, it's almost reliable. Uh, do you feel like you have actually have entered into a almost a professionalism with this? I know you've been a professional you're doing this for a long time, but does it does this like life cycle or like this this artistic cycle make sense to you now? It does. Now, I, well, number one, we we collectively had the uh, uh, the intuition to continue the momentum of the tour into the studio. If we took six months off or see you in a year or something like that. Things have a way of kind of, you know. Oh, I had a kid. Oh, I'm working yeah. on this other thing. Yeah. That we got right back on it. That was part of that kind of. I have the knowledge to like, let's keep the ship moving. If if it's going to move, let's keep moving. Yeah. And I still was able to take a break in the middle of making the record and go out and 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 tour on my own. Also previewing those new songs and then immediately going back and finishing. Uh, the record. It was a nice break for me to 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 get back in, but as I said at the beginning of the uh, of our conversation, I feel like I know what I'm doing now and I know how to do it. And there is, you know, I know Nick Cave like uh, he has an office. Yeah, and he goes into his office and works, and I don't do it that way. 
but once I get a song or two songs or I feel like I'm on the trail of a of a, a piece of material that I can expand on, I I attack it and 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 chase it down. So I have to. We we definitely have to. You've given us a lot of your time, so we should let you go in a minute. But I I have to ask. You know. I said right before we started recording, I've been here about eight months now. Your history in Los Angeles stretches back a bit longer. Yes. What has kept you in the city? Because I have to say, just as a fan of your music, records that you have made um, have opened opened up the city to me in ways I didn't know possible. Like it made me hear things in the city, made me see a different side of it. Mm -hmm. I still think about the cover of Powder Burns every time I see that view of downtown. Sure. Every Um, time I drive past Fountain of Fairfax, I'm like, what happened here? What's going on here? I still get a thrill every time I see Bonnie Bray as a street (laughs) name, and that's not even the most glamorous street. And there's there's the the Blackberry Bell cover is Mulholland Drive. Yeah, Yeah. it is because you seem to have managed to do the neat trick of of loving the the legend and the mythology and, and feeding into it of the city, mm-hmm. but you also live here and yes. you seem to like it okay. So I, I, I love living here. I'll tell you why I love, li- I, I, I always had a, a, a great deal of wanderlust and uh, had trouble kind of, you know, had commitment issues with, with cities. Um, once I got my apartment in uh, New Orleans mm-hmm. and got a house here, that totally calmed me down. Now I have the, now I have the wife and the mistress. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, and everybody's cool with it. So how uh, much time do you spend in New Orleans? For, like in a year? Uh, Depends. Probably like a quarter of the year. Yeah. You know, like uh, not in a row, but I I go down to New Orleans five or six times a year. Is that like? For professional reasons, or you just go to like like spiritually like Both. hit reset just Both. to get some beads, man. Yeah, yeah right. Um, um, if you've never been to Mardi Gras, you have to go. Like it's 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 the happiest place on earth. That day, <laughs> no no better way to spend a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. You know what I mean? It's a, it, it, it's wonderful. But Los Angeles to me, obviously, I love the weather. I love the culture. I love the architecture. I love the landscape. I love the ability. Like, first of all, like the state of California is, I mean, come on. I know. You know. <laughs> I'm very uh, grateful to be here. The, the, those of us who know, I'm not trying to tell everybody to come out here. Come visit, but please, you know, stay off the highway. Um, but uh, uh, the ability to, to get to the desert, to get to the ocean, to drive up mm-hmm. to Yosemite or Big Sur, or mammoth, or like it just the gifts are. I mean, I, 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 it's my favorite place. I like that the the analogy of it to 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 relationships like romantic relationships, though, because they're definitely cities um, where it's hard to grow old with them, you yeah. know. And certainly the financial re- what's going on in New York that's affected a lot of people's decision. But I know people, you know, who you live your twenties in New York, and then you're like, I can't imagine. Being here and not doing those things and living that life. Every mm-hmm. street you go on is like, yeah, you used to go like, out at night, you used to go to those bars. Getting now, an apartment on Normandy Beach or something for now, some people. Now you don't do exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, so, oh, right. yeah, I'll retire here. <laughs> <laughs> this is where right. the bodies are buried. <laughs> yeah. I lived I lived in New York for a year. Yeah. yeah. That was enough. It was you know what? It, it it was because I once you walk out your door in New York, you are in it. You are in it whether you want to be in it or not. If I walk out my door here, I'm like, I can kind of poke around. Mm-hmm. Like I, where where I live is, is all, I mean, if you, it, it's basically like a little like country oasis in the middle of, of the city. So uh, I love trees. I love grass. Not a lot of that. that that's also you. that's like saying I like sports. Rock star saying I like sports, <laughs> trees, yeah, and seriously. grass. Yeah. That's you're, yeah. you're flunking rock and roll one hundred and one, but you're living life. Sports, trees, or ass. Nobody rides for free. <laughs> Do you, are you still a big sports fan? Oh yeah, yeah. Is yeah. It, have you have you fully committed to the Dodgers and the Reds? Or are you still a Reds fan? I I still I still love the Reds are my family. Okay, Dodgers are my dear friends. That's good. Yeah, you're you've because you've you've created like a very big support system for Dodgers fans out here. But I, I yes, I I I love the Do- I love baseball. Yeah, I love baseball. I love basketball. I you know basketball lately has been very painful for me. Yeah, but uh, um, yeah, I mean watching the long slow death of the Clippers has been just. Uh, <laughs> Did you used because like. 
did you ever used to go down to Staples or wherever they used to play like before they were sure good? oh yeah Sports I used to Arena. Hear, like you could go to like for five bucks you oh could yeah see. for five bucks and watch watch them get beat by forty points Darius you know and Quincy I mean? yeah oh. <laughs> oh. Darius Miles I I I watched him many times he, he, you know. That didn't work out. Elton Brand was was a little bit of hope. Yeah. And then when Baron Davis showed up, and Elton Brand was like, "Yeah, I'm going to Philly." <laughs> and, so there's uh, a little bit of hope uh, for us too. And yeah. Then. And uh, and that was like, I'm like, okay. But then you know, then they, then they got Blake, and he immediately hurt his leg. Yeah. And multiple like, times. Oh, yeah. God. It's funny how you look back on teams like Elton, the Elton Brand, Baron Davis Clippers, and you remember that being like this point of hope. Mm-hmm. As I feel this way about like like the Evan Turner the best of the Evan Turner <laughs> Drew Holiday Sixers mm-hmm. where I'm like the best wait what was I thinking like was when you look at it historically it's yeah. like LeBron just wins every year unless right. Steph Curry or Tim Duncan and you look back and you're like oh yeah Elton Brand and Barron could have taken a run at that it's like are you a Sixer fan? I am yeah, yeah. Are you, we're both from Philly yeah. Yeah. okay so when I was a kid the, the Royals had moved out of Cincinnati by the time I yeah. became like conscious of the NBA and I didn't have an NBA team and I was, you know if, if I did it was it wasn't going to be the Pacers mm-hmm. no offense uh, but uh, um, Dr. J is the one guy that in my mind if I ever met him I, I would probably like maybe be a little freaked out really yeah of, of everybody like of of anybody. Like Keith Richards, I'd be like, "Hey, man, the Dr. J." I'd kind of hey, you'd I, give a set list to him. Yeah, be like, yeah, yeah. together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'd have a starting point. But like Dr. J, to me, is like he was kind of like my first hero. And uh, um, <clears throat> so that team with uh, uh, Caldwell Jones, George McGinnis, Moses Malone, Doug mm-hmm. Collins, yeah. like, like that. That, that was a team. Their, their championship team. Yeah, uh, uh, was. I loved them. And then I loved when Barkley showed up and Andrew Tony and all that gang. Like, I, I you know, big. You're, big giving, you're giving us a gift here. Yeah, big, we were, big, chil- we were probably Sixers children of Iverson as much as, yeah. I mean, Barkley. And, and, like, and Alan yeah. Iverson, yeah. like, lo- love him. Hate the Lakers. I always have. Yeah. Went down and, and, uh, uh, watched Iverson get a game. Game one. You, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That was, step over game. Sometimes I think that that game was the happiest moment of my life. <laughs> yeah. Like it maybe it never got better than that moment when he stepped over a turn. I still bad. think in a weird way the, ga- the game two loss when he clapped yeah. the staples yeah. like, 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 yeah. like basically like bring it. That was yeah. my favorite. <laughs> lo- lo- love love Allen Iverson and uh, and I hope uh, I hope Simmons can come back healthy and and, and turn. I hope around. so too. There's a lot of question yeah. marks. We're gonna let you go on this. I'm gonna put you on the spot, but okay. I, I'm just curious. Um, if, for people who who listen to this or have listened to our show who maybe aren't the fans that we are of you and your music, I have a big. I put a, together a playlist a couple of years ago of my favorite songs of yours. Very subjective. If you told people right now, this is not like. You're not doing this for Rolling Stone. This is right now in 2017. You're telling people to listen to one song that represents you at this moment. What song are you telling Toy them to automatic. listen to? Automatic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How come? Uh, it just it's it's probably the most pure performance that I've ever given mm-hmm. in my life, and it's it barely gets to three minutes long. Is no fucking around. It's kind of me distilled me now distilled into two minutes and 50 seconds and it's a perfect segue because it's on the new afghan wigs album in spades which when we post this will be available, available tomorrow yeah fantastic Greg Dilley, thank All you right. so much for coming awesome. thank Thanks, you man. guys Hey guys, I just wanted to say thanks to Sonos again for sponsoring the watch today. You know, they have this new thing called the Playbase. It's a incredible speaker for your television, right? So it just goes right under your uh, your television stand. It's slim. It's low profile. It just fits right in there. You don't even notice it. And if you do notice it, you're like, you know what? My television looks better. But what, besides looking good, what it does is make everything sound amazing. Whether you're talking about games, television, or movies, you'll be sitting in your living room. You've got the screen up. You, you're, you're, you're in the zone, but like maybe Sometimes the sound isn't this. No, no longer is that a problem. The sound is amazing on this thing. Let me tell you something else. I remember the days when it used to take like four and a half weeks to set up a home speaker system. 
and you had all the like grounding and the wires and you weren't sure like in and out and like no you just plug and play this thing man you plug it in it's got one pa- like one power cord one optical cord you basically just walk through on an app in a number of steps to set it up I can't tell you how it brings movies and television and games and especially sports to life in your room my wife is like what the hell I feel like I'm inside of a spaceship when you're listening watching Prometheus or something I'm just like wife that is just play base I don't know what to tell you so check it out go to sonos.com for more information Hey guys, thanks again to Books for sponsoring today's episode. Sending flowers has always been the best way to show someone you care, but it isn't always easy or satisfying. It's very complicated sometimes. Thanks to Books.com, there's a better way to buy flowers with a fully transparent pricing, an easy shopping experience, and an incredible selection starting at just 40 bucks. Show your mom or any mom that you care with flowers from the Books company. Just visit B-O-U-Q-S dot com and enter promo code WATCH for 20% off your Mother's Day purchase. Flowers will sell out, so don't sleep on this. Wake up. 